at this very moment, you can practically feel it. The plane of the ecliptic, that is the path of the sun around the celestial sphere, is crossing the celestial equator. Tilted as it is at an angle of 23 and a half degrees. Or another way to put it, at this very hour, one of only two moments of the year when the Earth's equator is the closest part of Earth to the sun, with both the northern and southern hemispheres sharing sunlight equally. You can feel it, can't you? <laughs> it's the spring equinox right now, right now. Uh, when hours of daylight equal the hours of uh, darkness, uh, roughly anyway. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of twilight this far north at dawn and at dusk, an in-between period that takes a little time to resolve. It's not like the equator where the, uh, the sun just, you know, drops uh, <laughs> under the horizon in a second. I'd love to see that someday. But um, now... Here's a question. Does the equinox affect the high gas prices? <laughs> the horrid suffering in the Ukraine? Or the re re uh, resurgent COVID infections in China and Europe? No. <laughs> no. And yet humans are celebrating today, just as they have for millennia, at places like Stonehenge and uh, Chichen Itza in uh, Mexico because more daylight is worth celebrating on uh, all the levels that we operate on, the physical, the emotional, the mental, the energetic, and the spiritual. And like I say, you can kind of feel it, despite this um, localized sort of phenomenon that's going on right now. So we'll sing a hymn about this very thing at the end of the service this morning, but for now, as the uh, daylight waxes outside, in here these candles wane as the story of Jesus darkens until on Monday, Thursday, we sit in complete darkness. So journeying through this holy season of Lent, let's agree to do the inner work of spiritual inquiry and pray for the Holy Spirit to attend us in new and fresher ways. This is the third Sunday in Lent. Announcements or joys or concerns today? Come on up. The microphone is yours. card and uh, Lorraine Gross and I are collecting books for our next book club which is going to be happening via Zoom um, on the last Monday of April. So we, if you have an extra copy of the book that we'll be discussing, Saving Us, uh, A Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World, it's by Catherine Hayhoe and I know that many are the Spong group did this as a discussion uh, group and, and uh, generated a lot of good uh, conversation. So we're going to try it out with uh, anybody else who would like to join us. It's a very um, easy read and um, just brings us up to date on the current uh, climate um, well, developments, or some people might say crisis. Um, there are other books as well. There's one by Bill Gates that I've just finished, and it's excellent. And there are other books on climate change. So if you couldn't get hold of this book, um, you know, you can join the discussion anyway. Uh, we'll be collecting uh, your emails if you're interested, so we can send you out the Zoom invitation. And uh, Lorraine and I will be sticking around at the end of the service to do that. Judy asked me to go next, so I'm Zan Harvey Jansen, and I'm helping with the reception for Reverend Dr. George Rogers Memorial Service, which is Saturday, April 9th. And so if you'd like to help with some of the food for the reception, um, that would be awesome, and I'll be downstairs afterwards. Thank you so much. Hi.
I have three announcements. Now, the first one is that Ruth West would appreciate your prayers for her healing, recovery, and rehab after her hip surgery last Wednesday. The next is about coffee. As indicated in the newsletter and with Reverend Kurt's permission, I am passing clipboards this morning in hopes that some of you will sign up for our pre- and post-service coffee ministry. <laughs> Many people are enjoying both, so it is obviously very worthwhile work. One clipboard marked before a service coffee a sign-up sheet, that's a short one, is uh, for exactly that. You make the coffee, bring it to the sanctuary for about 9.45, take everything downstairs after the service, clean up, wash the cups, and set them back up for the next Sunday. Debbie Stiles coordinates the before uh, church coffee service and will happily tutor anyone who will help. Debbie and Doug are away today, so we have Laurel and Gordon to thank for the coffee you are now enjoying. After the service coffee in Fellowship Hall downstairs has been prepared by the Reeses and the Swaries since we opened for in-person worship. We have really appreciated kitchen help from Lauren Nickel, too. We would very much appreciate your help, and we'll work with you so you, too, can learn the ropes. The sign-up sheet is set up with the date and two columns. The first column is, I will make coffee, and the second column is, I will bring treats. Some people love to bake and will bring treats for coffee time, but cannot manage the coffee part. Other people want no part of the treats, but will happily manage the liquids. Thus, you are invited to sign up for both or either. If you are going to do both coffee and treats, please put your name on both side, in both columns. And adding your phone number will enable communication should anyone need to trade with someone. Thank you very much for any help you can provide for this much-loved and important ministry here at United in the Park. And thanks to Barb and Norm for the goodies awaiting you this morning. Um, I have post-it notes on the bottom of the long clipboard, so if you need to make yourself a note so you don't forget that you're on, uh, help yourself. And the passing method will be, we will start in section one over here against this wall, and the clipboards will go all the way to the back of that row, and then they will cross to, the, to this section and come all the way forward and cross, and you get, you get it, right? Yeah. And lastly, those of us who face the back wall this morning may have noticed that we have a new memory board, our third. This is the handiwork of my dearly beloved Dale Swarry. It has been a big job and a lived experience while the first memory board hung out in our garage for months. Calculations and plans were drawn up, nerves were gathered, and saws eventually were engaged. Duplicating another carpenter's design and working with oak have been challenging. Alas, it has all turned out beautifully, and on behalf of the worship committee and our congregation, we thank you, Dale, for building it, hanging it, and always putting the plates on straight. Okay, let's, uh, let's begin our worship with the prelude. Our call to worship today is from the first letter of John, uh, written by nobody knows who, at about the turn of the first century, uh, 100 AD or thereabouts. The author advises new followers of Jesus uh, on how to discern true teachers as opposed to false teachers by their ethics. Oh, that's, that's wild, isn't it? By their ethics, by their faithfulness to Jesus' teachings, and uh, by their love. So this author understood that his readers were in transition from the state-sanctioned imperial cult of Rome to this new faith in a flesh and blood Jewish teacher who was also divine and that the transitional time itself was important in making their joy complete 
It's great, great stuff here. Uh, so let's read this responsively. Please stand if you're able. See what love God has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. That's exactly who we are. The reason the world doesn't know us Beloved, we know ourselves to be God's children now. But exactly who we will be has not yet been revealed. So let us praise the one who loves us. So that our joy may be complete. Let's sing. Please remain standing and let us pray. Holy One, you who are here and there and in between these equinox days give us pause this slender sliver of time suspended between winter and spring between cold and warm Christmas and Easter as sacred time fall, uh, falls over on itself forming ever more layers of green and purple and white we find ourselves yet again in the already but still quite firmly in the not yet. May these days be a loving reminder that so much of our time is liminal. So much of our time spent watching and waiting. O one who watches with us, your gaze ever upon us. Give us a blessing for the in-between. In the name of Jesus, who sits at the very change of time, B.C. and A.D., now and forever. Amen. Well, please turn to those around you and uh, give them a, a, the peace of Christ as you receive their peace of Christ. And do it, you know, in the way we've been taught. All right, that's what I like to see. Yeah, sprint up here. Sprint right up here. This is great. Um, all right, so last week. Come on up. No, it's okay. <laughs> last week, uh, the three of you that were here, remember we had, a, we had a big tent, and we introduced you once again to the congregation. They all knew your names before, but... Uh, but we needed to reintroduce. We've got two more here today. We've got Mac. Mac, how old are you now? Yeah, I know. I'm three. I'm three, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Hallie is back. Welcome back, Hallie. All right. And how old are you? Five. You're five. Oh, okay. Great, great, great. Um, so uh, Bailey, Benson, and Joseph are also joining us now. Let's talk about... Let's talk about how you got here. I mean, you're here now. This was the place to come. This was the place to be. It's like when you go to school, that's the place to be for a while. And when you go home, that's the place to be for a while. But what do you have to do to get there? There's in, yeah? Um, you yeah. Walk, drive, yeah. Yeah, fly, yeah, yeah, Star Trek transport, any of that stuff, sure. Let's take a little trip. Let's reenact how you got here. Come on this way, just follow me. And this is where you are for a while. This is the destination. There was just an in-between place. Now think of it. There's lots of in-between places, aren't there? Like what? What else would, what else would there be? Now Joseph said, like, when you're walking to school. Do you walk to school? Yeah. No. How do you get there? <laughs> Take a bus, yeah. So you're on the bus for a little bit, for a few minutes. You go from home, which is the place to be, to school, which is another place to be. But in between, you're on a bus. You say hi to your friends, maybe, or you sleep. That's what I always did. And, um, you know, there's lots of in-between places. So... We're going to go the long way to Sunday school today and visit another in-between place. Here we go. Here we go. 
we're walking, we're walking. <clears throat> we're limping, we're limping. <laughs> in between place in the church. You don't hang out here very much. No, but it's a nice ramp so you don't have to use stairs. You can come up here real smoothly and then come to the place to be. So what Debbie's going to do is lead you to Sunday school in all these in-between places. Places you don't hang out very much. Yeah, I know. Ready? Okay, go. <laughs> in-between places. That's what we're going to talk about. But first, let's sing. Well, here are some modern words of prayer. Let us pray. In these uncertain times, no place looks like itself. The loss of the hard outlines makes everything look strangely in between. Unsure of what has been or what might come. We are in this time of the interim where everything seems withheld. The path we took to get here is washed out. The way forward is still concealed from us. So as far as we can, let's hold our confidence. So help us, God. Help us, God. Hold that confidence. And help us to notice the moments between one thing and another. Because the more faithfully we can endure here, the more refined our hearts and minds will become for our arrival in the new dawn. Amen. Well, we've, uh, we've been talking all morning uh, with the kids and with the prayers and the reading so far about what psychologists call liminal time. Liminal time. It liminal is from the Latin limen, uh, meaning threshold or place between, you know, one place and another, that in-between thing. So we can imagine liminal space as uh, being like a doorway, like we did with the kids, or a stairway. Uh, when you walk from one room into another, there's a moment when you're in neither room, right? And both at the same time. That's liminal space in our lives. Uh, like, uh, again, we talked with the kids, are just full of it. Airports, hotel rooms, Hallways, stairwells are all liminal spaces. And there's liminal time as well. Uh, pregnancy is liminal time, right? And so is hospice. Any kind of, uh, any, any kind of period of transition in our lives is liminal. Training for a new job. Uh, getting engaged, if people still do that these days. Um, moving to a new place. I mean, adolescence leaves us in liminal time for years. As does retirement, uh, so I've been told. So notice the things between one thing and another as we just prayed to be able to do, is a spiritual description of liminal time, a spiritual practice as we transition from one state of being to the next, one way of life to the next. As the first letter of John uh, put it in our call to worship, beloved, we know ourselves to be God's children now, but exactly who we will be has not yet been revealed. A lot to unpack there. So those people, those people who are transitioning from what we know of as the first century A.D. to the second century, were in God's waiting room. And you've heard jokes about 
nursing homes and so forth being that. Um, but, you know, we're all parked in God's waiting room all these centuries later. In God's waiting room, there's no certainty about what the future will be and how it will be different from now or what has been in the past. We just don't know. Here's a couple of more uh, uh, New Testament examples of liminal space and time, although the Bible is just full of them. Uh, first, it's John the Baptist asking a liminal time question. Who uh, John the Baptist is cooling his heels in a liminal space. This is from the Gospel of Matthew. When Jesus finished training his 12 disciples, he went on to teach and preach in the villages. John, meanwhile, had been locked up in prison. When he got wind of what Jesus was doing, he sent his own disciples to ask, are you the one we've been expecting, or are we still waiting? <laughs> There's no more liminal space than prison. But Jesus answers John's question by stepping over the threshold into the new way of life. Listen to this. Jesus told them, go back and tell John what's going on. The blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. The wretched of the earth learn that God is on their side. Is this what you were expecting? Then count yourselves most blessed. Over the threshold there. Now, here's another liminal image from the Gospel of John that we usually only read on Easter Sunday. Um, see if you can catch the liminal time and space here. Early in the morning on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone was moved away from the entrance. She ran at once to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, gasping for breath. They took the master from the tomb. We don't know where they've put him. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early in the morning while it was still dark. While it was still dark. Now there's a liminal image. And whoever wrote this, you know, did that very purposefully. I mean, she couldn't imagine what she would find there when she got to the tomb. But because of her faithfulness and love, she put herself in the position to be in the presence of the risen Christ, whatever that may have looked like. So, how is the time we're living in now liminal time? Well, today is a liminal day, right? Uh, going from winter to spring, at least astronomically. But we're living in a liminal month as well. The COVID pandemic seems over. It's not the first headline now that when you open the newspaper or the wherever you, you get your news, it's kind of down <laughs> several stories in. But we know that the COVID pandemic is not really over. I mean, we're back at church and we can go to grocery stores and restaurants now without masks, but new subvariants of the coronavirus are raging in China and Europe. And as much as we don't want to think about it, the uncertainty can still kick up some anxiety if we're honest about it. It's still out there, mutating as ever before. And then, of course, we are in liminal space in the geopolitical world as well. Are things on the threshold of a hotter war in Eastern Europe or on the threshold of a settled peace? We don't know. We just don't know. Will Ukrainian refugees come pouring into Edmonton? And what should our response be if and when they do? The uncertainty is unsettling. Even if you've given up watching or listening to the news, we still feel that sense of unsettlement. I mean, and we're also in a liminal decade now, a liminal half century, because climate change has put the world 
between the old normal and a disturbing new normal. Yeah, there's wildfires all over the place. There are droughts. There are floods. It's not like it was 50 years ago. Things are different now. Where are we going? Nobody knows. And then there's our church, our congregation. We're in a liminal time between the old governance structure that we've had since time immemorial and a brand new one. Very exciting, but we're not there yet. Between old ministers and a new one. Who will that person be? We don't know. There's a committee, yeah, yeah, you know, but we don't know yet. It's liminal time. These pandemic months have been stressful. A brutal time for some. I mean, people are exhausted. People all over the world, there's still so much confusion. And with confusion often comes self-doubt. The future is filled with possibility, but we're all just a bit worn out. I mean, reopening our building and regathering the congregation physically, as we've done, won't solve our disorientation, although that helps to open up again. But we're still stuck between something that's ended and a new thing that's not quite ready to begin. We're in liminal time here. And we can't resolve this liminality, if that's a word, by, by planning our way through it, although that helps a bit too. But we have to experience and learn our way through it. As human beings, we tend to overvalue what is and undervalue what may be. That's the reason growth and change are so difficult to endure. And it's why we usually prefer the status quo. Maybe we gravitate towards the tangible and the familiar, and we know we do. That's human, all too human, and God is well aware of what it's like to be human. We don't like a lot of change. We like things the way they were. But they can't be the way they were anymore. So here's the reality, and we all know it. Uh, preachers just remind people of stuff they already know. That's our very strange job. Um, <laughs> Here's the reality. We can't grow into this new way of life, into what the future holds, without enduring the ache of letting go. This pain, this grief, no matter to what degree, is the price we pay for stepping into the liminal space, into the in-between space. When churches, or any organization for that matter, stops growing, it's usually because they've reached a threshold of pain that they're unwilling to endure. And that's utterly understandable. Sometimes when people realize that they're in liminal space and time, they'll, they'll look to something, someone, anything outside of themselves to tell them what to do and to relieve the pain. There's all sorts of examples we could come up with. Many are political, so I'm going to not talk about those. You already know what they are. So living consciously with presence of mind in this space of liminality requires a lot from us. It requires some emotional skills as well as spiritual ones. Finding ground inside of ourselves where there doesn't seem to be any outside place to stand. Finding ground within ourselves. Remaining open-minded and open-hearted when we just want to close up and shut it down. We need to be a non, each of us, as individuals and as a congregation and as a nation, need to be a non-anxious presence in the midst of turmoil and fear that's going on all over the world. Jesus tells us to relax. That's not a biblical word. That's, that's no uh, Greek word that's translated relax, but it, it works. Jesus says, are you tired and worn out? Come with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. 
Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Don't worry about that. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. So that's what churches are for. To learn and relearn and relearn again those unforced rhythms of grace that take us over the threshold, out of the liminal space and into a season where the sweet sunlit days are longer than the cold snowy nights. Amen. Amen. And now God is with us. Let us lift our hearts in prayer. Let us center ourselves for prayer. Vast one, who forms the light and creates the dark. As we sit here in the transition between winter and spring, help us to notice the moments between one thing and another. The soft, delicate shift between two things. The space between awake and asleep. Between a bud and a bloom. When the sunrise becomes the day. And when the colorful twilight becomes the night. The moment from unborn to first breath and the fleeting second between last breath and death. Help us, O God, to notice the inconspicuous moments when pain becomes a mere memory, when a child becomes an adult, when the face in the mirror is no longer a reflection of callow youth, but a fully mature human being. Help us to notice the simple and lasting moments. The last piece in a puzzle, the last sentence in a book, the last cadence of a piece of music. Simple words that soothe. When sorrow becomes joy, when alone becomes connected. So thank you for going with us and all who are so desperately in need of your healing touch. Thank you for going with us into the mystery of the days that run in haste before us. Show us the everlasting in the perishable. The hope in the helplessness. The purpose in the chaos. Help each person here get up every morning glad that its sunrise seconds have the height of your eternity. In silence we turn to you individual for the sighs that are deeper for words, deeper than words, giving thanks for the healing brought to those members of our congregation who are so in need of it. Remembering especially this morning Ruth and George and the family of Elaine and the family of Maxine. And we sum up these prayers with the one Jesus taught us to pray saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, forever and ever. Amen. Well, let's sing our, uh, our Equinox song. These are words written in 1939, talking about liminal time. But uh, this author thanks God that the sun is rising again and there's more hours of daylight. Let's stand and sing. Mm-hmm. 
So all this thanks for rain and snow and sun leads us right to Isaiah 55. Let's bless ourselves with these words. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, making it bring forth and sprout, so shall my word be that which goes out from my mouth. But it shall accomplish that which I purpose. And succeed in the thing for which I said it. For you shall go out in joy. And be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song. And all, all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Amen. Be seated for our, uh, our uh, postlude. <clears throat> 